listening to Everlasting Ministries, equipping Christians through media. Get ready as we dive into the Word with my husband, Pastor Eric Ureen, as he preaches from Riverside Christian Church in Roseville, California. I'm really excited about this message. As I began studying this week for this sermon, the Lord really worked in my heart and revealed a lot of things to me personally in my life. So it is my prayer that this sermon will be as much a blessing to you, if not more, than it was to me. We've been in a four-part sermon series dealing with human emotions. We started the series out looking at the biblical way to deal with anger. And then last week we looked at the need for us to control our tongue. We'll conclude the series by deconstructing the biblical way for conflict resolution. Tonight we're in part three. We're going to examine in detail envy and jealousy. Living a life of envy and jealousy is detrimental to the health of a Christian. This is a very bold statement, but you need to grasp this. Jealousy and envy is not what we are called to participate in. In fact, I believe the level of envy and jealousy in our life can be a very good thermometer of the current condition of our soul. When I was doing some research on the internet, I found out that the number one reason for murder is envy and jealousy. And usually that occurs under the domestic household unit, but it is the number one reason for murder, envy and jealousy. In fact, one publication uh, from a secular magazine even called envy the mother of murder. And I thought that was a very interesting choice of words as it very accurately describes the reality of the origin of murder. You see, it's the mother that gives birth to new things. Oh, come on now. Some of you are going to get this in a moment. This statement is no surprise because as we read in the accounts of Genesis 4, it was the very motivation for the first murder when Cain killed Abel with a rock. He did it out of envy and jealousy. Envy truly is the mother of murder. This exemplifies why we need to take this subject seriously, because in its full blossomed form, it can give birth to murder. James 3, 14 through 16 says it this way, but if you are bitterly jealous and filled with self-centered ambition, don't brag. Don't say that you are wise when it's not true. That kind of wisdom doesn't come from above. It belongs to this world. It is self-centered and demonic. Wherever there is jealousy and rivalry, there is disorder in every kind of evil. Jealousy, envy, is self-centered and demonic in origin. Now I want to ask you to take a moment and think of a time where you experienced envy or jealousy in your life. It doesn't have to be a major situation. It could be something as trivial as you seeing something that someone else had that you really wanted and you didn't think they deserved it. Or maybe you just ran into a celebrity that you envied them and their position. Whatever it is, I just want you to capture that moment and put it in the back of your mind. Because as we discuss this, I believe that you're going to be able to take a needle and thread all of these things together in your life having to do with envy and jealousy. So you can wrap them up, cast them out in the name of Jesus, and not work through them ever again. There are four dangers of envy and jealousy that we see in Scripture. Number one, it will divert us away from what God is actively working on in our life right now. It will do this by refocusing our will and our attention away from him in a split second. And we become captivated with that sin that is dangled 
in front of us. The question is, when this happens, what was the emotional trigger? We could be going about our daily walk with God. He can be showing things to us and revealing things through us. And then that carrot gets dangled in front of our face and we are snatched away from the moment into envy and jealousy. Number two, it will pull our souls towards the things of this world that are perishable. You see, when we became a Christian, we are no longer of this world. Amen? We are called to focus our attention on God above and to invest in things that will not rust and wither. Yet these feelings bewitch us with circumstances and things that are solely of this temporary world. The bottom line is envy and jealousy is a waste of our time. It's a time sucker. And as long as the devil is keeping us distracted with trivial things, we are running out of time to do the purposes of God. And as long as we are wrapped up in envy and jealousy, we are being taken away from what God's purpose and will is for us to be doing right now in our life. And time is the one thing money can't buy. We only have so much of it. And number three, it will lead us into rebellion against God's will for us. You see, whenever we choose to align ourselves with envy and jealousy, we ultimately end up in pursuit of the very things that are not God's will for us in that moment. We chase after the counterfeit that the enemy is trying to distract us with. And by going after those things, we walk out of God's will. And number four, as we'll see later, it can also lead us to actively participate in the fight against God. And let me tell you, if you're fighting against God, you're on the losing team. Amen? Envy and jealousy are two different words that are often used interchangeably. The differences are somewhat subtle but very distinct. So let's begin by taking a look at the two of them. Envy means a resentful longing aroused by someone else. The definition of jealousy. Jealousy is the state of actively feeling or showing envy. Well, that's very good. How do the two of these play out through human emotions? They play out in these regards. Envy is a burning desire to get. Jealousy is a burning desire to keep. Envy is craving what someone else has, and jealousy is clinging to what one has. Envy is focused on gaining something. Jealousy will focus on losing something. And envy is rooted in ambitious pride, while jealousy is rooted in anxious fear. The ultimate solution for the struggle of these emotions is the total commitment with Jesus Christ as our chief shepherd. Several months ago, we did that sermon series on who is the shepherd and what are the qualities of the shepherd. The shepherd will lead us with his voice, and we are to hear and follow and obey. And he always leads us to the pastures that will give us the provision and the necessary needs and resources that we need to accomplish his perfect will. He'll bring us to the places of, of safety and will bring us to the direction of the calling of our life. That is why Jesus Christ has to be our chief shepherd. When we accept that, we find trust in him, and through that, we can have contentment. When our life is totally yielded to the Lord as shepherd, we see that we will have trust, peace, satisfaction, fulfillment. And pleasure will grow contentment to a size that will occupy so much space in our heart that there won't be any room left for envy and jealousy. How many of you know what I'm talking about? We need to allow all those things to fill our heart with Jesus to a degree that our hearts no longer have a place for envy and jealousy. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we are the landlords. And as the landlord, we have the right to give eviction notices. 
If envy and jealousy have residency in your temple, it's time to throw them out with an eviction notice. Amen? Come on, I know I'm preaching to somebody here. You don't have to give them a 30-day notice. You don't even have to put it in writing. All you have to do is declare it with your mouth in the name of Jesus. It's time to take ownership over your home. And every time they try to come back, shut the door in their face. In fact, better yet, don't even answer the door when they come knocking. Amen? Glory to Jesus. I love how Job said it this way. Job 36, 11. If righteous people listen and serve him, they will live out their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. Did you catch this, saints? If righteous people. What is a righteous person? A righteous person is someone that seeks a life of purity, that runs from sin, that desires in their heart to be Christ-like. Now, there are times in your life where we will stumble and fall, but at our very heart, our very core, our desire isn't to run after sin. Our desire is to run after righteousness. And then we need to listen. We need to have the ears to hear God. When we went over the sermon series on, on hearing God, one of the requirements for that is to have a, a softened heart, a heart that's available to God. Is your heart available? Are your ears open to hear His voice? And then we need to obey. When we hear, we need to follow through and trust in God and what He's telling us to do and be obedient to Him. And then our days will be in prosperity and our years in contentment. Hearing and obeying God will result in transformation. It's the required commitment that leads to the fruit that comes from being a follower of Jesus Christ. I got to say that again, because some of you aren't hearing me. Hearing and obeying God will result in transformation. It's the required commitment that leads to the fruit that comes from being a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, after accepting Jesus Christ, we get a new purpose that leads to a new priority, birthing a new plan, resulting in transformation. The new purpose is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We read that in Romans 8.28. The new priority is God changing the way I think, the renewing of my mind. That's Romans 12.28. Too. And then the new plan is for us to rely on Jesus Christ's strength to be all He created us to be. Philippians 4.13 If you're a Christian, I want you to say this prayer to yourself right now. I want you to tell God, I will be conformed to the character of Christ. Tell Him, I will line my thinking up with God's thinking and tell Him that you will fulfill His plan through His strength. That's biblical. Amen? The minute we begin to doubt God's perfect plan for us, it leaves the door open for envy and jealousy to come back in. We must root out all seeds of doubt and discontentment that will threaten the promises of God for our life. So how do we do that? Once we have evicted envy and jealousy from the premises, it's time to lock the doors and arm the security system. As a husband, one of my jobs every night is to go around and to check and make sure that all the windows and doors are locked, and then I set the security alarm. We need to do that for ourselves. That means tearing out the roots, the roots of jealousy and envy. Now I went through scripture to find some of these roots. I'm sure there are more than the ones I have listed, but these are the ones that stood out to be the primary Root causes for envy and jealousy. Number one is arrogance. There is nothing that we can do to make ourselves deserve what we have. God is the source of what we have. All our abilities and gifts come from God. That's the bottom line. As a Christian, there is no place for us to be arrogant. 1 Corinthians 4, seven. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment. For what do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? That's pretty plain and simple. Number two, 
comparison. I think we all understand here what the Bible means when it talks about comparison. Um, my wife is really good about doing spreadsheets and putting together all the formulas and calculations to compare two different things, like if we're going to go car shopping and stuff. Some of us like to do that breakdown. Some of us like to just buy things you know, from the feelings of our heart. Oh, I'm just going to buy it because it looks good. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about comparison between you and another believer in Christ. God made each one of us to be unique. We are all unique here. It is pointless to compare ourselves to each other. Every area of our weakness is a place where God can reveal His strength. Amen? If one of us are weak in another place, that's a place where God gets to reveal himself through us in his strength. God called you to that new job. If you feel like you're weak in some areas and that you're not going to come through, well, guess what? God's going to come through you in those areas and he's going to display his greatness and his power and his authority in your weakness. And your coworkers are going to look at you and say, how the heck did you do that? And that's your chance and your opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ and say, hey, it's not me, it's Christ at work through me that gets me to be able to do what I'm doing. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he told me, my grace is all you need. My power is strongest when you are weak. So I will brag even more about my weakness in order that Christ's power will live in me. Comparison. It's not good. Don't go there. And number three, competition. God created each one of us in his image. Amen? When we compete against others, we are competing against what God is doing through someone else. If you're on God's side, you need to choose to care about others rather than compete with others. God has a different calling and a different purpose on each one of our lives. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Don't act out of selfish ambition or be conceited. Instead, humbly think of others as being better than yourself. Don't be concerned only about your own interests, but also be concerned about the interests of others. Number four, covetousness. God commands us not to covet, so we need to refuse to obsess over what other people have that we don't have. Instead, we need to be thankful for what we do have and be thankful for what others have. Our future inheritance is far better than anything on earth. And that future inheritance, of course, is unshakable. Look at Hebrews 12, 28. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping Him with holy fear, and awe. Be thankful for what you have, for every good and perfect gift comes from above. I'm telling you, if it's good and it's perfect, it came from God. Let him know how thankful you are and worship him with holy fear and awe. Number five, discontentment. God will not hold what is ultimately good for us, so we must rest in contentment with everything he has provided us. You see, God's not going to give you something you can't handle. He's especially not going to give you something that's going to drive you into sin. If you want something and he's put it on your heart and you haven't got it yet, you need to be praying, God, what is it in my life that I need to change? Where do I need to grow in so I can get to the place to handle the responsibility of that blessing? Psalm 84, 11, For the Lord God is our sun and our shield, he gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. There it is. Do what is right. What is it that you need to do to get to the place to receive what it is that you're waiting for? Number six, this one really spoke to me. Insecurity. God gives us his total unfailing love and guidance. We mustn't fall into the trap of false security that comes from people or things. Have your security in Jesus Christ, not in the things of this world. Psalm 143.8 Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. 
Show me where to walk, for I give myself to you. Have you given yourself to Jesus? Do you let him show you his love each morning? And number seven, I'm sure we all know this one, because this is the one that came before the fall, pride. God is God and we are not. Our motives will determine the problem we are trying to resolve through envy and jealousy. We cannot control everything in our life, but we can choose to surrender and trust in God as He is the only person that has the control and He is the only person that has the power to save us and He even saves us from ourselves. Amen? There have been a lot of times in my life I know where He saved me from myself. I thank God for that. Exodus 23. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous, meaning impassionate God, demanding what is rightfully and uniquely mine. You see, God will not tolerate the transfer of honor and worship that is due to Him to anything else, an object or a being or even ourselves. Sometimes we become self-deceived. We are serving ourselves over God. When we decide to go after our own self-ambitions in rebellion against God, we're worshiping ourselves over Him. We're putting our trust in ourselves over Him. If this applies to any one of us, I pray that it doesn't. But if it does, we need to repent and ask God to forgive us. I want to close with this analogy I'm not really one that's into video games, but recently my nephew had a birthday. Lo and behold, they had a Star Wars video game. Oh, cool, I'm down with that. So we started playing, but there's something that kind of hit me. When you play a video game, eventually when it ends is when you die. Well, the devil likes to play games, and one of his favorite enticements to engage with him in a game is envy and jealousy. Now, let me tell you, the devil doesn't like to play games alone. He enjoys having as many team players on his side as possible. But his problem is, God's the other player. And not only is God the one who designed the game, his hand is on the power plug to the entire gaming system. God's going to win. In fact, it's already finished. When Jesus died on the cross and his blood was shed, he said, it is finished. You see, from God's perspective, everything having to do with that was done in a moment. But see, we're still caught in linear time. We only have yet to get there, but from His perspective, it's already done. As we read in Revelation 12.10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation, power, kingdom of our God, and the authority of His Messiah have come. The one accusing our brothers and sisters the one accusing them both day and night without ceasing is in the presence of God and he has been thrown out of heaven forever and as we know his final resting place is the lake of fire. Saints, don't waste your time playing with the devil. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the importance of this message, God, that we seek to come to a place where we can represent you as you have called us to be ambassadors of Christ. That these emotions, God, have no place within us because they are not of your character. And we pray that our character represents yours, that our minds be conformed to your mind, that our heart will beat for the things that your heart beats for. Lord, help us to get to the root of these things in our lives, to tear them out and to bring new things of healing in its place, Jesus, that we can walk out of these doors here tonight fulfilled and restored and healed in a greater place closer to you than when we came in. And we ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening. We pray this sermon was a blessing to you. May your faith be strengthened in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For more information, visit us at our website at www.everlastingministries.com.